all in. Yeah, everyone's oh, in. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, our OAL webinar series. It was really fun to be out there at all the 3CA conferences. And um, though Mujia and Rachel and I couldn't be at all, we thought, why not make what we've talked about at the ones we were at available to everybody else? So appreciate you jumping into this experiment with us and hopefully it'll be a rewarding time together. Um, let me pray as we start and then I'll pass it over to Rachel and we'll we'll rock and roll. Hi, good to see you, Rudy. Hey, Rob. Let's pray. Father God, thanks so much for this chance to be together through technology. Thank you for these awesome people and their passion for you and their heart for camp ministry and for the youth and families and churches of our world. We just pray, Lord, that you would bless our time. You would guide Rachel. May this be a, a wonderful process of learning and growth. Commit this time to you in Jesus name. Amen. All right, awesome. Good to see everyone. See some familiar names and faces. A um, couple of just brief technical things. If you're not, if you're not used to Teams, um, like Zoom, you can uh, mute and unmute. So, um, if while you're not talking, you have yourself muted, that will help prevent any background noise. Um, and then there's also a chat function, which um, we'll use throughout our time together and also have an opportunity um, at the end for question and answer and dialogue. And we'll use the chat um, as a way to gather some of those questions as we go. Um, and then we are recording this. So if, if there are others that uh, want access to these after the fact, um, after all three are over, we'll share a link to a, a file with all three webinars um, for sharing. So. We are jumping into our first one with a conversation on investing in women in outdoor ministry. Um, and uh, Rob or Mo, I'm assuming one of you has access to keep letting people in. So I'm going to stop clicking yes and, and hope that one of you can do that. I can do that. Okay. Yep, we got it. Yeah, sorry. What just happened? Did she mute? You just muted yourself, unfortunately. Weird. Okay. There we go. Am I good now? Yes. Okay, that's odd. As I clicked the slide, it muted me. Um, so as I do this presentation, I always like to start with a question of why are you here? This is kind of a, a unique topic, I think, in the fields, one that we don't haven't historically seen a lot of um, presentations on within the 3CA world. So I'd be curious if you'd be willing to just throw in the chat, um, why are you here? Why why show up at this webinar? If you've got a bunch of people in the room, um, whoever wants to answer can. Um, and as, as you do that, I'll just kind of give you a overview of why I'm here um, and why I've chosen this session as um, one of my greatest passions over the last couple of years. Um, so obviously I am a woman in Christian camp ministry. Um, and for the most part, I feel I've been blessed to um, have a journey where I have felt um, very supported and encouraged through uh, various experiences of life. So I started in Christian camping um, as a single female with um, very few ties to anything or anyone or any place. Um, and 12 years later now, I uh, am married with two children uh, live out of state, um, and through all of those life transitions, um, the Lord has continued to give me a passion for camp ministry, um, but the challenge has been figuring out how to fulfill that with all of these other life callings um, coming up in the last 10 years. Um, I've also had a lot of uh, peers from my graduate school years and then students as I stepped into teaching who have not had the experience that I've had, who have run into significant barriers, um, who have experienced great challenge and who have been um, honestly just very hurt by some of the encounters they've had within the field of Christian camping. And through processing those experiences with peers and students and thinking about my own experience, it's just become very obvious that this is a conversation that we need to be having. Um, and so in the context of sectionals, in classes, in side conversations, 
Um, I have a heart and a passion for starting conversations around this topic, um, and this is a, a, an example of that. So I hope that a lot of you are here for similar reasons, because that is what that this is going to be about. Um, this is a conversation starter. Um, I, I have a question that I bring to the session, and I have an answer at the end that I will attempt to succinctly propose to my question. Um, but ultimately, this is about a conversation that we need to be having amongst ourselves and in our organizations. Um, so here's the big question for me guiding our our session. Um, if women make up a large portion of our talent pool and research shows that having women at the leadership table improves our effectiveness, how can we ensure that they are developing and thriving as female leaders in a traditionally male dominated sphere? There's some assumptions in here. OK, so the first assumption is that Christian camping is a traditionally male dominated sphere. And I'm going to show you some data in a little bit that I think supports that claim. Uh, but that's an assumption Two, um, There's a data driven assumption in here that having women at the leadership table improves our effectiveness. And we do, in fact, know that when women and men work together, we are more effective. And there's a lot of research to support uh, to support that claim. Um, we also know that um, women tend to struggle to thrive in this type of environment where there's not as much representation, there's not as much history. Um, and so, so my big question is how do we bridge all of those things together and ensure that women can thrive in this, in this space? So to answer that question, um, three parts to this study. Um, fast facts, women's leadership theory, and then an attempt to answer the question. Um, there's a lot of other pieces to this conversation that we don't have time to cover today. I'm happy to share additional resources um, if you want to contact me after the fact related to the history of this conversation um, and integrating some other fields of study. But this is what we're going to focus on today. Fast Facts is going to give us the lay of the land. Women's leadership theory is going to help us press into and name some issues. And then answering the question is going to give us some of those conversation starters. So first, some fast facts, big picture, and then we'll we'll focus in and do some more focused uh, facts on Christian camping. So we know that women's participation in the U.S. labor force has been climbing since the mid 1900s. Um, and I didn't update this to the 2022 data, but you can see just from 1948 to 2016, um, more women are in the labor force than ever before. 70% of mothers with children under 18 participate in the labor force with over 75% employed full time. And that's from a recent 2022 um, US labor statistic. Um, and then thirdly, mothers are the primary or sole earners for 40% of households with children under 18 today compared with 11% in 1960. So women are in the workforce and women are in the workforce despite having multiple roles, being home with children, um, working part time. We're seeing women getting into the workforce in greater rates than ever before. However, despite being in the workplace, there are large gaps in the public's view of the types of pressure men and women face. This is just a few um, that I think highlight the point. Um, in a study asking US adults, um, what percent feel that men or women face a lot of pressure to do certain things? Um, the responses look like this. 76% said that men feel pressure to support their, their family financially, while only 40% of women. 68% of men feel like they need to be successful in their job or career. 44% of women. Um, and then the pressure switch for being an involved parent and being physically attractive. Um, and this is looking at all adults saying, um, do you think men feel this particular challenge or women? And you can see that in general, there's a perception that men feel more pressure to be successful and support their family and women feel more pressure to be an involved parent and to be physically attractive. There's a lot more data points there, but you, you can you can see kind of the contrast in some of those values. In addition, in terms of um, finances, women's earnings tend to plateau mid-career while men's continue to climb. So even as women get into the workforce, um, you've probably heard conversations about um, a glass ceiling in a variety of different ways, a pay gap, 
Um, and we do know that women make less than men across the board. But what's interesting is that women's earnings will actually plateau and then go down as they get older, while male earnings will continue to go up. One more related to leadership in particular. Um, when asked if you are comfortable with a female CEO, 94% of all adults said yes. 90% of men said yes. 97% of women said yes. But this is the kicker. 77% of evangelicals said yes. And while that seems good, it is much less than the greater proportion of all adults and even of all men or all women. This is really important for our conversation because we're not just talking about women in leadership. We're not just talking about women in outdoor leadership. We're talking about women in Christian outdoor leadership. And those factors all coming together create a really challenging landscape for women. Evangelicals, though comfortable with working with women, are the most hesitant to this big cultural shift of women entering the workforce and leading in that space. And along with evangelicals, it's not just faith-based, there's also an age gap. So millennial, when comparing millennials versus elders, 84% of millennials are comfortable with women and only 57% of elders. This again is important because the average age of a director in Christian camping is over 50. They're not quite in the elder gap, um, but they're also not millennials. And so we're dealing with, with differences based on faith. And then we're dealing with a bit of an age gap in um, directors versus emerging women. And that impacts um, how we view and value women in the workplace. Okay, focusing in a little bit more specifically on women in the camp workplace. Um, this is from a recent 3CA Compass survey. And it just shows the percentage of directors that are female within 3CA. And if you just take a quick glance at this chart, um, hopefully you can see that you are much more likely to get a job as a female director in Christian camping in low budget camps. Um, and it, it, it goes down, it goes up pretty dramatically from a $3 million budget camp down to 200, under 200,000 for a budget. Um, the range goes from 5% up to 30%. In some work done by Dr. Jake Sorensen at Sacred Playgrounds with uh, United Methodist Camps, Retreats, and Conference Centers, he's asked a similar question. And while the, while the progression is actually similar, where there's a higher percentage of female directors in smaller camps, um, they have been more successful over time in getting more women into those positions. Um, and even at those larger budget camps, they're seeing at least 25% of directors being female for camps over $1 million in operating budget. So there is, I think, also a denominational fluctuation, um, which is not surprising given that um, a lot of mainline denominations are also supportive of women as priests in the pulpit, as ordaining women. And so you're perhaps more likely to see that as a denominational camp. Um, but it's just interesting to see, even in the camp workplace, there's, there's some sort of complex dynamic influencing the ability of women to get to the higher levels of leadership, um, particularly in larger camps. So kind of bringing all of this together, in this fast facts section, and I apologize for kind of flying through this. It's hard to fit all of this in an hour. I'm just trying to give you the main points while still leaving time for discussion. Um, so one quote and then a summary. And this is this first quotes from Barna. Among 20 something women, we have seen a prioritizing of career over marriage or family. While this is a widespread cultural shift for women, some of this desire comes from a knowledge that it's difficult to do both to be both a mother and a manager. And so they want to spend their 20s establishing their careers, hoping this will allow them more flexibility and security when they do decide to become parents. So this is Barna's explanation of some of the transition we're seeing both in women in the workplace and in the delaying of uh, marriage and motherhood for men and for women. So to, to summarize and kind of bring all this together, we can see that women are in the workplace, including in the work 
the camp workplace in greater numbers than they have been previously, but their experience in the workplace is different than it has been before um, as they wrestle with different dynamics, as they postpone certain um, life transitions in order to advance their career. And it's also different in the, the experience of men in terms of the pressures they feel, the money they earn, and the respect they have as leaders, particularly in evangelical context, and I would argue particularly in Christian camp context. So if we want to answer our big question, we have to understand some of these pressures. We have to understand where they come from um, and figure out then what we can do about it. So that's what we're going to do next is look at uh, what I'm calling leadership development. I don't usually do puns, but this one was just too hard to resist. Um, I also saw a recent thing from uh, a, the Christians and Student Development Association, ACSD, I think it's called, and they're doing Empower Her, so it kind of gave, gave me the idea. But my premise is actually that we talk a lot about leadership development, but we assume that the process is the same for everyone. Um, and I want to argue that there's some key differences between men and women in the leadership development process and use that to help answer our question. So here's some basic leadership development um, foundations before we look specifically at the gender piece. So first, I, I would hope you would all agree with me that leadership development is a lifelong process. It is not something that happens in college. It's not something that happens in your first five years in a job. It is something that develops over time. You develop an identity as a leader, you develop leadership skills. Um, and as you go throughout your life, you have a variety of different contexts in which you're applying those. Family being the first, relationships being the first, and then moving out to there to more professional spheres of influence. But it is a lifelong process, it never ends. It begins with an understanding of and an ability to lead yourself. Um, we lead self before we can lead others. If we don't master leading self, um, we risk burnout and we also, I think, risk harming those that we are leading. Third, leadership is about influence. And some, some positions have more influence than others. We can try as much as we want to say you can lead from anywhere. And while I would agree with that, it would also be naive to deny that certain positions bring with them more responsibility and more influence than others. And then lastly, related to that point, leadership development cannot be reduced to movement through a pipeline. If it is a lifelong process, if, if it has as much to do with your own self-understanding, emotional intelligence, ability to lead self, and if it is about figuring out how to use your influence in all different contexts, then it cannot be reduced to movement through a pipeline. This is important because when we talk about developing leadership pipelines, we often assume that you have to move through this very strict progression in order to get from an entry level position to an executive level position. But that fails to acknowledge all of these other important aspects of leadership development. OK, so with that in mind, leadership development, what, what do we need to talk about here? Um, big picture. There's a good bit of writing on differences in male and female leadership journeys in general, but also in outdoor leadership and ministry. Um, this, this is a result of a variety of things. Um, first, there's different historical backgrounds in the field. So I have a whole section that I sometimes do on the history of women's involvement in the outdoor field. Um, and for the most part, the earliest camps were designed and run for males by males. And oftentimes women were included actually not at the suggestion of men, but at the suggestion of women, women coming in and saying, hey, we want this for us. We want to lead this. We want something for women um, and them initiating programming for women and for girls. So there's different historical backgrounds in the field. Um, there are different priorities and women and men make different choices in life. Um, and that's OK. And, and ultimately, at the end of this, I, I don't want to ever suggest that all women should choose to pursue their career in Christian camping at all costs. Um, some women feel called to stay home and be a mom. And that is a wonderful thing. And I don't ever want to make people feel like they need to pursue um, long term career. But 
all of this research that we just talked about shows that more and more women are going to try to live in that tension instead of making the move from career to the home um, as has historically been done. And then lastly, there's different challenges and barriers experienced along the way um, related to how God made us uniquely as men and women, but also related to some societal and cultural challenges. So two big questions. How do we as women engage our own career development journeys? And then how do our leaders who in the Christian context are mostly men assist us in this process? So to do that, I want to look at two big two big categories, career development and something called role congruity theory, because I think these are the two most prominent factors that play a role in the development of women in career. So when it comes to leadership development, um, about 20 years ago, uh, some scholars who were doing some research on how women develop and experience career um, proposed a model called the kaleidoscope career model. And essentially what they argue is that well, the traditional understanding of career is that of a ladder where you move from position to position. Um, women experience career and perceive career more through the lens of, of a kaleidoscope. So kaleidoscope is something that changes as you twist it. The view looks different. And as the view changes, you make different decisions. So women are much more likely to make career decisions based on relationships and the impact those decisions will have on their relationships. Um, so ra rather than thinking, well, I need to get to the next rung, women will think, well, how will this impact the people that I'm closest to? How will it impact me and my relationship with the, these people? Uh, and thirdly, what do I want in future relationships? Um, not in terms of romance, but just in terms of peer and community and mentorship. Women are going to make decisions through that lens, less through the lens of position. The three things women tend to want in career within this kaleidoscope, the things that they're looking for, the things that change their decision making are authenticity, balance and challenge. And this study in 2018 suggested that these things always exist together, but that different seasons of life cause women to prioritize different things. So, so women in the childbearing phase with young children, the number one priority of all of these three things tends to be balance. Challenge kind of ebbs and flows based on what's going on in the background, and authenticity tends to become much more important later in life. But they, all, they always want all three, but different things become priority and influence the decisions that people make in their career. When it comes to moving along, I don't like to say up, but moving along in their career journey as they seek to balance these three things of authenticity, balance, and challenge, the two things that are most important for advancement are affirmation and invitation. So women are much less likely to advocate for themselves than men are. And as a result, being affirmed and invited to the next level of leadership is a key aspect for women, um, especially as they try to balance these three things in tandem. Multiple callings um, is a way to describe the essentially the multiple careers that women perceive for themselves. So. Women perceive family, raising family as a career. Women perceive uh, working in a Christian camp as a career. Women perceive working, uh, volunteering at a church as an element of career. And so that, that creates a sense of what is called, at least through the vocational lens, a sense of multiple callings. And so when we talk about leadership development, because women are looking through this kaleidoscope, bringing um, multiple different aspects of life into their vision of career, it's important that we talk about how women balance multiple callings in their understanding of their leadership development. And perhaps the most important thing to talk about is the role that relationships play in women's career trajectory. Because women's relationship status will impact their employment far more than it does for men, at least based on current research. Um, studies asking people to rate the qualifications of candidates with all things being the same except parental status 
tend to show that moms are rated lower in competence and called back half as often for job interviews and rated as less likable just from viewing a resume. So summarizing this um, in a book on women's leadership journeys, one author argues that nothing is more damaging to a woman's career trajectory than being a mother. This is largely because for some reason, having children makes women, but not men, appear less qualified and less available. Ironically, um, we often in the church receive a valuable critique, I think, of talking about marriage and family too much and singleness not enough. Um, and I think the temptation can be equally relevant in this context. We can talk about all the challenges for moms in outdoor ministry, um, but there are equal challenges for single women in outdoor ministry, because on the flip side, having no children, having no fam familial relationships um, can make women seem more available and research shows can then lead to burnout and loneliness. So challenges exist on both sides of the relational spectrum. This has a lot to do with cultural assumptions associated with motherhood. Um, those that become moms wrestle with these multiple callings in ways that men don't. Um, and those that don't become moms, especially in Christian circles, are often surrounded by people that assume that they want to or should be moms or at the very least want to or should act like moms in their career spaces. This then typecasts them into nurturing roles and again, neglects the need for balance um, and personal life for singles in ministry in particular. So part of the challenge of career development for women is the way that emerging relationships impact the way we're perceived in the field and also the decisions we make. Now, I, I don't want to uh, move on without um, naming an important conviction for myself related to the value of gender. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that there are God-given differences in men and women. Biologically, physiologically, psychologically, there's a whole body of research to support differences between men and women. These differences, I think, are good. The meaning, the cultural meaning that we attach to these differences is where it becomes problematic. So just to give a couple examples, in a book called Brain Rules by Brian Medina, which is actually a, a book often assigned in um, educational training, but I think has relevance for this context too. Um, he talks about how women are generally more emotional than men in the sense that they utilize the emotional side of their brain more than that men do, especially when handling stress. Okay, this isn't like an anecdote. I think women are more emotional. This is like brain science shows us that women use that part of their brain more so than men in stressful situations. This means that in stressful situations, women are more likely to show emotion, to be tearful, to get angry when compared with men handling the same amount of stress. It doesn't mean they're not handling it well, they're just handling it differently. We also know that women are more likely to be depressed, partially because men produce serotonin faster. That's a biological, psychological aspect of the difference between men and women. Men are more likely to struggle with eating, with reading early on, again, because of the way male brains work in contrast with female. And then as one final example, young girls tend to make friends through talking and eye contact, while young boys through commotion and action. I was just reading an article this morning um, by John Haidt, he's a sociologist. He actually just wrote a really interesting article on the value of camps in partnership with the American Camp Association. But I found another article that he had written on the impact of technology on boys and girls and his comments on the unique impact that technology has on boys um, because of how young boys develop relationships and how their minds tend to be more attracted to um, m machines and technology and those kinds of things. Your, their minds are just more stimulated by those things. So there's important differences between men and women that I think we need to acknowledge and value, but we need to wrestle with the cultural meaning that we attach to some of those differences. Because when we attach cultural meanings to those things, 
we run into an issue of role congruity. So role congruity um, appears in the literature again and again and again as one of the most significant challenges associated with being a woman in leadership. And this is where the, the Christian context and the outdoor context create an added measure of complexity. Um, and so after I kind of briefly introduce this role congruity concept, I'll talk a little bit about that. So role congruity theory tells us that leadership has to be both asserted and received. Okay, you cannot lead if someone doesn't also accept your leadership. It has to be asserted and received. Choosing to follow is dependent in large part on whether or not we feel a leader deserves to be followed. So receiving that leadership is dependent on our ability to say, yes, this person, this person deserves to be followed. I'm going to receive their leadership. If we don't perceive that a leader is competent or skilled as a leader, we won't receive their leadership. This is problematic because in the U.S. in particular, leadership continues to be male normed. This means that the cultural definition of leadership does not align with the cultural expectation of being female. And how we perceive women then has a significant impact on whether or not they thrive. Research has shown that we expect women to be things that we don't expect leaders to be. We expect women to act in certain ways that we don't expect leaders to act. Women are expected to be less assertive, more diplomatic, and more relational. These are qualities that tend to not be associated with leadership. Leadership is about being more assertive, less relational. Whether that definition of leadership is right or wrong is not the focus of this session. But broadly speaking, the traits we associate with women and the traits we associate with men are different. This creates a role congruity tension. And for a lot of us, it's not even at the conscious level. It's subconscious, but it impacts the level at which we are willing to follow. Deborah Road, in her book on women and leadership, wrote it this way. An overview of more than 100 studies finds that women are rated lower as leaders when they adopt authoritative, traditionally masculine styles. Autocratic or power-seeking behavior that is acceptable in men is penalized in women. Female supervisors are disliked more than male supervisors for giving negative feedback. Another author, a little more uh, wittily, said, says that, um, Men are accused of being aggressive when they bomb countries. Women are accused of being aggressive when they put you, in, put you on hold on the phone, right? So aggressiveness is judged at different levels in, in these two different contexts. This can create a bit of a uh, damned if you do, doomed if you don't reality for women. Because if you act too much like a leader when leadership is male normed, you're not acting female. When you act too female, you're not acting like a leader. So how are women supposed to step up into leadership within that tension? In the end, though, all of this aside, studies have shown that it's a combination of male and female traits that make for effective leadership, which is why I think that a lot of what we're talking about here exists on a subconscious level. Even I think within the Christian camping sphere, we understand leadership in a more nuanced way. And yet these subconscious assumptions continue to impact the way that we receive leadership. Okay, last piece on this, role congruity in the outdoors. There is a 1000 page book called the Palgrave Handbook um on women in outdoor leadership international handbook of women in outdoor leadership something like that it's an extensive book full of peer-reviewed articles on the experiences of women in the outdoors and a lot of them press into or are framed by this issue of role congruity now it's not written specifically from a christian context it's just looking historically the experiences of women in the outdoors and the premise for the book is related to this first point the natural environment continues to be a male domain. 
So you take everything that we just talked about in, say, the business world, and then you add this element of the outdoors. And the outdoors is even more of a masculine space than the workplace in general. Participants in outdoor programs have a gender bias in favor of male leaders. And in multiple studies, women are often portrayed as having limited and passive roles in the outdoors, in outdoor photography, and in stories of leadership. They're type passed into nurturing social roles in the outdoors, leaving the technical stuff to men. And in general, female competence has to be proven in the outdoor space, while male competence is also is generally assumed. So because masculinity is often associated with the outdoors and femininity is not, um, females feel greater pressure to prove their competence in the outdoors. And it's harder to receive leadership from a female in the outdoors because it continues to be a very male domain. All of this together can create a very discouraging environment for women um, where competency becomes the major constraint, both in terms of our own self-perception of our competency and in the perception that others have for us, except for in those more nurturing roles. Okay, that, that was a uh, very quick journey through some women's leadership theory. I wanna return to our question. If women make up a large portion of our talent pool and research shows that having women at the leadership table improves our effectiveness, how can we ensure that they are developing and thriving as female leaders in the traditionally male dominated sphere? Couple questions and thoughts for moving forward, and then I'm hoping to spend at least the last 10, 12 minutes on question, answer, and dialogue. So first, I want to start with a word of encouragement. So 3CA has um, a searchable database of articles written in the various forms of their magazine, um, and a review of four articles on women in leadership over the last 20 years reveals, I think, that the conversation is changing. So some of the earliest articles, early 2000s to today, there's a shift from talking about serving as a camp spouse as the primary role for women in Christian camping to actually talking about women in leadership. There's a shift from a narrative of women can lead, but you should wait for it to come to an encouragement that women actually step up and advocate for themselves in leadership. There's a shift from you're a leader no matter where you are, to a proclamation that women are effective leaders in camping. And then fourth, there's a shift from, we should find women mentors and learn from other women, to here's how men can actually work to equip women in this space. And we, this is all evident in articles written within the, in the CCCA world. So it is changing in a really positive manner. But I think we have a lot of work yet to be done. So I've got two categories here. First is questions for organizations. And then second is questions for women. So questions, things to think about for organizations. What does it look like to set and respect appropriate boundaries while still investing equally in developmental conversations and mentoring women? One of the biggest barriers to um, developmental opportunities for women is a lack of intentional mentoring by the gatekeepers who predominantly in Christian camping are men, a lack of investment from male directors in, in investing in and mentoring women on their own career journeys. Somehow we need to make sure that we're finding a balance where we are respecting the appropriate relational boundaries that need to be in place between a male and a female, while also making sure that the females in our spaces have equal amounts of developmental conversations and mentoring time with um, leaders that are further down the road. So that's the first one. Second, in what ways is role congruity, especially in a Christian outdoor context, influencing the thriving of women in your organization? If you talk to enough people and have honest conversations about how we receive and assert leadership, issues of role congruity will come up and finding ways to advocate for women, being women and being themselves in their roles, I think is an important consideration for organizations. Pay scales, are your pay scales truly even 
for men and women, if you ran an average of hourly pay for men and women, would the rate be equal for their longevity and their experience in the field? How are single women treated in the organization? What are the implicit messages that might be being communicated to single women in the responsibilities that they are given and the expectations that you have for them in their roles as single women? And having conversations with those single women to find out what the experience is like. In what ways could your leadership development pipelines and organizational leave policies be negatively impacting the ability of childbearing women to advance through positional pipelines? If in order to get from point A to point D, you have to fulfill roles B and C, we are very unlikely to see women advance to that final stage because for a lot of people, positions B and C are gonna line up with their childbearing years. And we have to find ways to acknowledge that the skills that women develop as mothers are equally valuable to the skills they might develop in other roles. Being able to re-enter a positional pipeline, a more hierarchical understanding of career without going backwards after leaving the career for uh, to be home with children and family is going to be an important consideration. What would a gender inclusive camp staff spouse community look like? If, we, if we're going to see more women in leadership roles at Christian camps, it also means we're going to see more male spouses. What does the supportive male spouse community look like? Life in, in Christian camping as a professional staff member is an all-in kind of life. And if we're not finding ways to make sure that spouses that are not also in camp, because not all spouses are in camp, um, we're creating potentially systems of unhealth for women whose spouses are not in the field. And we need to find ways to support that perspective of staff spouses as well. A couple more. Are you doing enough to affirm and invite women into higher levels of leadership? Women don't want to climb the ladder is not an accurate response. Women need to be affirmed and invited, especially in spaces where they don't have a lot of models of women making it that far. So are we affirming and inviting women? Are we giving space for a relationally based career development process and equally valuing it and having conversations through that lens instead of a positional career development process? And in what ways are your programs historically and or currently typecasting women into specific roles and experiences in the camp context? Sometimes women choose to be in specific roles that are more nurturing, nothing wrong with that. But let's become aware of areas that we are actually unintentionally typecasting women that don't want to be in those roles into those sorts of roles. Okay, questions for women. This is for any women on the call trying to figure out a career in camp ministry. A couple things for us to think about. How can we continue to develop ourselves in pursuit of our God-given callings, whatever that may be? It can be really easy in this conversation, I think, to place the blame elsewhere and forget that we also have to be developing ourselves as leaders. We also need to be refining our skills, becoming more aware of ourselves, our strengths, our weaknesses, um, and honing in on those areas of growth that are revealed to us. Second, let's not climb the ladder just to climb the ladder. Again, a result of this conversation can be, I want to stick it to the man. I'm going to prove that you can make it, but don't prove that you can make it just to prove it. We need to be intentional about pursuing our callings, about discerning where God is leading us in whatever season that we're in and being faithful to whatever God reveals to us through that process. Ultimately, we, Everyone, men and women, have to make decisions. And women feel more pressure to make different decisions than men. That's not all bad, but we have to be willing to make some of those decisions and stick with them. Thinking about what balance is going to look like for whatever season we're in, um, what level of challenge we're, we need. And honestly, sometimes just the big picture question, what do you want? Which is a really hard and vague question, but when you really take the time to think about it, I think can be really insightful in giving you some wisdom for what your next step should be. What mentorship do we need to get to where we need to be in 10 years? And where is that going to come from? We need both male and female mentors 
to help us develop in the field. And so thinking about who those people are that can walk alongside us is a key next step. Are we aware of our own strengths and weaknesses and able to identify the difference between healthy feedback and role congruity based criticism? We will get feedback and it is not always because we are women. We get feedback because we are people and healthy feedback from healthy mentors helps us grow and we need to be willing to receive that. Are we speaking up when we feel unheard, advocating for ourselves or angrily shutting down? We have a responsibility here to women to speak up, to advocate, to do things that maybe we even culturally feel less uncomfortable with. Women, for example, are way less likely to advocate for an increase in pay. And a lot of that, I think, comes from cultural assumptions about what it means to be a woman. What does it mean to push against that and to say, no, I have the confidence. I, I, I can ask for this. I will boldly ask for this instead of shutting down and getting bitter. And then lastly, are we actively contributing to the culture of the organization or creating a divisive subculture? Are we working with the men in our spaces to create a healthy culture where men and women can thrive? Or are we off in our own little corner um, talking angrily, gossiping about the challenges of women in this space? How are we contributing to the overall learning? All right, so all that together, here we go. Last thought, and then we'll open it up. We had our big question. Here's my response. How do we make sure women are thriving? Here we go. We work together to create cultures in which it's normal for women to be in all roles and for women to be women in those roles. We invest resources, time, money, and relationships into helping women, regardless of their relationship status, healthily fulfill their callings in camp ministry. We intentionally encourage and affirm women as they fulfill those callings and take time to provide mentorship and guidance across genders. We become aware of the spaces in our camps where female voices are absent and we invite them in. We challenge our assumptions related to role congruity and we work on follow followership just as much as we work on our leadership. We prayerfully, humbly, and willingly start hard conversations. And perhaps most importantly, we take time to listen to the stories, experiences, fears, desires, and challenges of women in Christian camping. All right, questions, thoughts, ideas? Let's have a conversation. We've got about 10 minutes left. You can put them in the chat or you can unmute. I have a question. Awesome. Um, I think I've had a little bit of this discussion with you in the past, but um, just wanted to hear, I guess, more about it or maybe if other people had thoughts, but um, just the recent idea of like the higher up you go in camp ministry, there's more men, but then there is the struggle to get men at the lower levels of leadership, like with camp counselors and, mm -hmm. um, you know, even our, our grad class this year, there's only two men and they're both living in Wheaton. And so just the lack of male leadership up here uh, at Honey Rock. Um, so wondering what your thoughts were on that um, dynamic. Yeah, that's a good question. I, so in higher ed in general, um, we're seeing a disproportionate amount of women compared with men in higher ed. Um, so just in terms of, I think, your talent pool, perhaps, at the staff level, right? If a lot of our staff are coming from colleges, you have more women in colleges that are available. But then you go to the next level and say, well, what's causing the higher ed? <laughs> uh, what's causing that balance in higher ed? Um, that article I mentioned by Jonathan Haidt had some really interesting thoughts on it and just the way that um, men are more easily pulled into the virtual world and satisfied with that. Um, whereas women, because women are more relational, are less likely to be satisfied, like satisfied with that and more likely to seek out relational contexts. Um, 
in all stages of life. And so I think, I mean, Christian camping is a very relational space. And so it, in that sense, almost flipping the conversation we just had is more attractive for women because it's so relational, but it's, it's a bit complex because uh, it is also an outdoor space, which is traditionally very masculine. So Jake Sorensen in his book um, talks about uh, Christian masculinity, I think, or some version of that term, um, and how oftentimes historically the Christian character movement was associated with these hyper physical understandings of what it means to be a male. Um, and for men that don't feel that in the same way that women can experience of value for the outdoors and physical experiences on a spectrum, men can as well. Um, it, it can become a space where they feel like they're not welcome if it's not something that they grew up with, um, something that would be more challenging, something that will threaten their pride um, if it's something they don't feel that they're skilled at. So I don't know that I have a perfect answer for that other than to acknowledge that it is an interesting dynamic in contrast with this conversation. Rob might have an answer. I don't know. Mm -hmm. One other thing we've talked about relative to engagement in our grad program and that it's 75% plus women versus men uh, is do women feel the need for advanced degrees to get more credibility in the field, whereas men don't feel the need as much? And is that at play relative to a graduate program? In outdoor ministry. And especially, yeah, faith, a faith based program, because you can add all the dynamics about church enrollment across genders too. And that also shows predominantly female engagement. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a good connection too is that the church is tilts women involvement more than men. Uh, so there's something there too going on, um, but generally speaking, there's just less engagement by men, it seems, except maybe in the workforce. I don't know. I'd like to echo the question that I, I couldn't see a face mouth moving, but whoever the first <laughs> question person was, the woman that said. I have the same problem. I've been at this job for 10 years. 95% of my senior leadership, <clears throat> which could be either men or women, I don't care. I just want the right person for the job. 95% of those are women. If I took my hands off the wheel at this camp, it could be run entirely and populated entirely by women. Um, I have a wife and four daughters, all of whom I love dearly. But my concern is, and my eldest daughter is already facing this, where are the guys that are capable of doing this stuff? Um, that's that's my challenge. My gender imbalance issue is 95% women, and we're a small camp. We're not rock climbing camp. You know, we're basically a traditional summer uh, residential camp. So, we, you know, that may play into the outdoor leadership thing. We don't really deal with that because we're just regular camp. But that's my issue, and I don't know how to address it. And that's my concern is, who are these awesome Christian women going to marry if these boys are still living in the basement? <laughs> and what does it mean for camp ministry in five years if there's no men engaged in the developmental process at this point? Or and and the, few boys, the few boys that come to camp don't have any male role models. It just seems like a downward spiral. Believe me. In the way I'm sorry to dominate here, but my office, the, the way the camp office is set up, the leadership is like in the inner circle. I'm always on the outside on purpose. And at least 60 percent of those leaders are female. They do a great job. I'm not knocking them in any way. I want to promote them in every way I can. But we've got an issue with not enough guys in the pipe and aimless. So anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if I if I had to boil it down to like one core issue, in some ways it's the same as the core issue related to this conversation about women, 
when we typecast people into super gendered understandings of who they are, I think you're ju you just kind of shut down. So, um, if if men and boys feel scared to come to camp because they don't feel like they have the skills, they haven't been exposed to the outdoors, they've not been equipped, they haven't been modeled, they feel like they're not a real man, so they can't go into this manly space. It's kind of the same problem. Um, and if if there's one thing I've been learning over the last year in some of my research on faith and families, it's that the solution to the faith crisis within the church has nothing to do with targeting children and youth in the next generation and everything to do with targeting parents. Parents pass on what they have. If parents have a moralistic faith, they will pass on a moralistic faith. If fathers have a distorted perception of what it means to be a Christian man in a post-Christian world, that's what they're gonna that's what they're gonna pass down. So one of the things I've been wrestling with is what does it look like for camps? to impact in transformational ways, parents, perhaps even before kids. And that's a total like philosophy shift, but I, a lot of it does come down to modeling, it seems to me. All right, last minute, any final question or thoughts? Okay, uh, last thing I want to say, um, women on the call, that, uh, how do I say this appropriately? Um, I, I am not in a lot of spaces where this conversation is openly had amongst women. And it's important to me that some of the stuff that I talk about is validated or invalidated by people in the field. I would love to hear from you how much of this is true or not true for you. There is this much research or writing this much on women in Christian camping. Everything that I've dove into over the past four years on this topic has been interdisciplinary. That means I'm pulling from other areas and extrapolating, applying it in a new context. And now I'm trying to test out the ideas and see where they line up. So if you would, would you help me? What lines up? What doesn't? What else needs to be part of this conversation? I think that's the next movement uh, for the Christian camp world in general to start thinking about. And your uh, email is available to everybody through the invitation. Yes. Yeah, you all got an email from me today if you are on this link. So I just put it in the chat, but please yeah, awesome. engage Rachel on the topic and help us. Fantastic. This is also beginning to be recorded and we'll make that available and uh, might be a fun thing to gather your staff at your camp and watch it together and have a conversation as a way to open the door. Um, so yeah. thank and if, you. If you want resources too, I can send you a list of all the references in there. Thank you, Rachel, for putting the time and effort into it. Thanks for sitting in. Awesome. <laughs> so anybody on the call today that I mean, a lot of people here are already engaged with our master's program, but this is kind of stuff that we engage in our master's program. And if you're interested in more conversations like this and pressing in, would invite you to consider joining us. We're going to have a meeting, another online meeting next week that you'll get an invitation to where we just overview the program. Um, I would love to share with you some of what that's all about if you're interested in pressing in with us. And tomorrow, then the day after. Yep. And there's another webinar tomorrow. Yep.